In order to solve a problem, one must first acknowledge that there is one. From there, a myriad of ideas can be cultivated and potentially become an overarching solution. Alcoholics have the 12-step program, understanding that they are weighed down by their addiction and their only fighting chance through it is by placing their faith in God. Large construction businesses have state and federal departments, administrations, and agencies regulating on-the-job practices that ensure a safe work environment. The legislative branch of the United States has the executive and the judicial branches to either veto a bill that may harm the country at large or interpret it as unconstitutional legislation. Although these particular systems are effective at diagnosing problems within a system and providing solutions for them, there are a few issues with this model. A solution may create new problems for the future. A solution that's meant to be all-encompassing may miss a few minute problems that are outside of the purview of the original solution, or the solution neglects to take into account extenuating circumstances. Which is why those who are strong advocates for social justice, whether they're feminists, progressives, LGBTQ+, etc., have a unique way of identifying the problems of a system called intersectionality, a more complex way of understanding different systems of oppression, how they manifest, and how different groups are affected by them. Essentially, it's a more fleshed out 12 step program, except it examines external problems to a system versus the internal conflicts of an individual. But what exactly is intersectionality? Kimberly Crenshaw, a law professor at UCLA and Columbia University, coined the term intersectionality in her 1989 essay, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Using black women as a framing device, she develops the idea that despite the efforts of anti-discrimination principles culturally and legislatively leveling the playing field in terms of sex and race, in the case of black women, they're left in a limbo of sorts where they don't fit neatly into either category. An example she uses? The the Title VII case to Graf and Reed versus General Motors. Long story short, five black women took General Motors to court because they believed the company discriminated against black women, specifically their seniority-based layoffs that placed all black women hired after 1970 on the chopping block. The results of the trial went in favor of GM, essentially because the plaintiffs couldn't prove black women went through discrimination. From the court's perspective, since they weighed sex and race discrimination separately, GM hired white women on the office side and black men worked the factory, showing no signs of discrimination on either end. Ultimately, the court concludes, This lawsuit must be examined to see if it states a cause of action for race discrimination, sex discrimination, or alternatively either, but not a combination of both. Or in layman's terms, either you're female or you're black. There's no in-between. Because the experiences of black women are unique when compared side by side with either white women or black men, neatly placing them into either the sex box or the race box is difficult to say the least. Which is where intersectionality comes into play. It's an analytical framework where it takes into consideration the multiple perspectives of marginalized identities and how those groups are affected by different forms of oppression. What's effective about it is, anyone can use it. Though Crenshaw uses black women as the device to explore these ideas, other writers and thinkers before the term existed, like Gloria and Sherry, with their book alongside other women writers who identify as feminists and LGBTQ+, wrote about how their sexuality and class is incorporated with race and gender oppressions. What intersectionality does is leave no stone unturned. From people of color to people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, these different groups can use this framework to better understand how different forms of oppression fuse and impact their lives. But with every framework, there are a few things that keep it from working optimally. Before anyone is able to enter a nightclub, a person must follow its dress code. If everything on their person is above board, then entry is allowed. If not, well, better luck next time. It's a barrier to entry that ensures the people who visually fit the nightclub's clientele gain access to its services, which is an effective way for filtering club patrons, but not when it comes to an analytical framework that is important for advocacy assignments. Intersectionality has a bit of a gatekeeping problem where most people will have a difficult time engaging with the material. There's nothing wrong with the material in and of itself, but more so it's the average person who is also a social justice advocate trying to understand the idea can be compared to a person trying to face the rubric wall. Think about it. This is a concept conceived within the halls of academia by a law professor locked away from the general populace through complex language and a paywall called tuition. Because the learning curve is already at a 7 on a scale of 1 to 10, not many people are willing to participate in advocating the social justice platform. Does that call into question those individuals' position as an ally? Possibly for some. In the game of advocacy, doing your own research and being well-read enough to publicly address the platform to potential allies is standard fare. But if a move movement uses an analytical framework that requires their lowest ranked members to hit the ground running before they even learn how to crawl, then Houston, we have a problem. It's one thing to gatekeep ideas through language, but once the rank and file obtain the knowledge, it's time to watch the Ouroboros eat itself.
The poor sleep on an empty stomach, dreaming of the day they can eat the rich. Occupy Wall Street was a movement in 2011 in response to the poisonous financial influences corporations have on the US government, and the wealth disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Despite the large turnout and support for the movement, it barely lasted for two months. How is it possible for a large left-wing populist movement to quickly bite the dust? To begin answering the question, one needs to understand the progressive stack. If intersectionality is the analytical frame used to help marginalized individuals understand how oppressed they are, then the progressive stack is intersectionality put into practice. It's a way to organize speakers during a protest where marginalized voices are placed in the spotlight. The more marginalized identities a person holds, the higher they are placed on the stack. Although this is a considerate gesture for Occupy organizers to implement, there are a few concerns with this model. The progressive stack prioritizes every single perspective in order to achieve consensus. Keep in mind, it is important important for a movement's body politic to be on the same page, but this kills any momentum build when everyone is too concerned with making sure every idea is heard. As democratic as most protests should be, too much democracy will make the group look aimless, as if it had no concrete solution to offer, which is a major gripe people had against the Occupy movement. A protest is nothing without the bodies that make up the crowd. If the opposition can see the ocean of people that back the movement's message, the process of negotiating and making concessions can be made easier. For the average protest, the demographic makeup should be negligible. A body is a body. But if we're going through the hierarchy of the progressive stack, where the most important voices are the ones belonging to the most marginalized, it may sour the taste of other members because their thoughts and ideas are ranked lower based on their immutable characteristics. Why is group equity of opinion more important than the overall objective? Unfortunately, intersectionality by way of the progressive stack occupied a lot of the movement's time. It's acceptable to listen twice as much as one speaks, but if work is not done afterward, then the machine only operates at half capacity. Intersectionality is a tool to better understand oppression. Created by a law professor, she used the concept to explain why the black woman's experience should be relegated to neither black nor woman, but both. As a result, it is a framework many groups use today. Despite the benefits of understanding, there is a barrier to entry that obstructs potential proponents from engaging with the material. The progressive stack or intersectionality put into practice may help signal boost marginalized voices, but at the expense of a movement's momentum and actively missing the forest for the trees when it comes to the entire group's objectives. In short, it's a very useful tool, but it can't be the only one used. But hey, what do I know? Thank you for watching the video. Give us a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. Click on the bell to be notified on future uploads. Share the video around the internet. And again, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next one.